really starting to take shape as a good little buggy and really looking forward to getting the radio gear in and getting it out on track. Hi guys, Brett here from Hearns and today is the third episode and we continue to build the Tamiya re-release frog. Uh, where we left off last time, we had the, the chassis done, we've got the, the front suspension done, uh, we've got the gearbox done and in, differential and the rear suspension arms. So continuing on with the build looks like there's not a whole heap left to do. We've got to in fact put the shock absorbers on, put the radio gear on, um, put the wheels together, paint the body. So moving forward, let's jump in and have a look where we were. Okay, so we are in fact up to the shock absorbers. Now before I go any further, I can just notice on this build that there's a slight notch in the suspension. It's not quite as smooth as it could or should be. Now I put that down to um, the O-rings in the dog bones. They've, they've asked me to put three here in the instructions. Now I've got a feeling that those, that those dog bones are actually binding on the diff out drives and on the axle stubs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take apart. I'm going to remove one O-ring from each side and see if that fixes up the problem. Now you often get things like that in a build and it's really a case by case, case by case scenario and you have to sometimes not build the car as per the instruction to get exactly the right feel that we're after. And that comes to just practice, I suppose, experience and feel. So I'm gonna go ahead and take one of these O-rings out of this rear dog bone assembly and see what we can find. Take the rear arm off. So we've got one in there. And we've got two in this side. So I'm going to remove one O-ring. It's a bit sticky from the grease. Put the dog bone back in. Line it all back up like so and these cars are such a cinch to work on they're really really good go ahead and put the screws back in and we can see already we've improved the feel i'll go ahead and tighten up the suspension mount and then we should have lost that that bind or that tight spot in the suspension travel Go ahead and tighten this up and confirm that. Now you are, as you're building a new kit, you are going to experience probably a little bit of tightness and binding, but it should be smooth. And that's exactly what we've got now. So it's not exactly falling under its own weight, but we have in fact got a smooth operation from its uh, full extension to minimum travel. And once that runs in, that's going to be perfect. Whereas this one here, we can say it sort of pops in and out of, of movement. And I think it's just at that midpoint there where the, the O-ring is just too tight. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove mine from this side as well. And that should help the suspension work as it was designed. Alleviate some binding and probably increase the overall performance of the car. Go ahead, take this side off. Get this bracket out. I'll leave the dog bone in there. And I'll go ahead and take take that one out. Drive shaft back in. Oh, so much better. Make sure I've located the dog bone. And you can go as far as hand finishing, filing and wet and drying absolutely every part on this car, but 
for its intended purpose I don't think there's really going to be any gain in that and by the time that we've run two batteries through it the whole car should be fully run in but at least now yeah perfectly smooth yeah smooth on this side all right let's continue with the build so it's, we've got these beautiful to me shock absorbers to or damper units to assemble so i've got some parts trees here and what they've actually done is they've given us three tuning options so we've got one hole we've got two hole and three hole pistons now that's going to change the the dampening characteristics of the shock absorber and because i'm going to be racing this car on a fairly um fairly hard pack track so not a, not strictly a soft surface a fairly hard pack track with with jumps in it i'm going to go for the one hole piston so that the damper unit doesn't collapse as much um, and protect uh, potentially um, smash the the rear gearbox or the rear of the car into the ground we can always change these later anyway it's something that's just a tuning part that we can do so here we go got the piston times two we'll get the other one hole piston it's imperative on these shock absorber parts that there's no flashing you want them to operate perfectly smooth inside the damper bodies like so there we go okay so I've got those we've got the we've got the piston we've got sorry the o-rings the shaft o-rings oh actually hang on a second that's a revised part so I can see here in fact that they've given us so that must be the old parts tree so we have in fact got the new new parts within the bag so if I had read the instructions through in its fullest so we do in fact have the three hole pistons to put in there um, and that's probably because they've redesigned the, the damp units and in fact increased the size so they've retooled up new pistons which are much better than the black plastic ones these are a Delrin or, or Teflon coated piston which are going to give even better better performance so we've got those we've got o-rings last thing that I think I'm really needing we've got the shock shafts we've got the springs here is the C clips the E clips where have I put the E clips Okay, you can see the importance in having your parts trays, making it easy to rifle through and get the parts. Three. And there should be one more. There we go. There's one more. Okay, so then we can go ahead and start assembling a shock absorber so the first thing we're going to do is assemble the piston onto the shock shaft and this shock shaft is a, a highly polished piece or chrome plated piece of, of steel so it's imperative that we don't scratch it grab it in a vise or any jaws um, obviously because that'll scratch and score the o-rings uh, or potentially create leaks so i'm going to go ahead here we'll get these snapped on i'm just using my little pliers here to snap on this o-ring this eclipse like so Such a tight little e clip, these ones. I 
listen for that snap sound there we go get the piston in there nice and smooth put the top one on top one should hopefully be a little bit easier because we can slide it against the top of the piston snap there we go then I'm going to get my gizmo tool and ensure that it is in fact in the groove properly and it should be able to spin freely in its groove without coming off like it's doing there perfect beautiful machining there by Tamiya and good quality assembly there's no play in the piston yet it can spin nice and freely giving us a really good damper unit the second one again exactly the same technique click again click and give it a little spin yeah beautiful that's our shock shaft assembled now I'm going to go ahead and assemble the cartridge now these are where the o-rings sit now what I'm going to do here I'm going to use some XTR o-ring grease to make sure that these these o-rings are well coated and it actually protects them from the oil and debris. So I've got one, one there. So I get one into the body. Like so. Push that in. Second one into the body. Be pretty generous with the grease any excess will just come out of the way anyway like so i actually need a cloth just bear with us a second okay guys i'm back with my rag just want to keep it clean and controlled get the other one to the same point both the o-rings in you can see here I'm using my hand little gizmo tool I wouldn't dare use anything sharp or abrasive especially a hobby knife or anything like that because you really don't want to put any nicks into your fresh o-rings putting this grease on it here will ensure smooth operation and guard against swelling of the o-rings which will happen over time but we want to prolong the use and it's a matter of just servicing them and after we've run it for probably a couple of a good good 10 batteries or so it's probably time to rebuild them and service the shocks anyway and all the parts will be reusable you just freshen the oil re-grease the cartridge and off we go okay the next one next part i've got to put in is the guide the shock absorber guide the shaft guide keeps it all nice and moving super smooth got this one here nine steps cutters here working beautifully as always no flashings can go ahead and put our guide in and then we can go ahead and screw up the nozzle like so Give it a little bit of a wipe off. Building the shock absorbers on these cars can be a little bit messy. A little bit of oil and like I said, make sure you use rubber grease. Then I'm gonna go ahead and put the shaft in. And before I put the shaft in through the O-rings, I'm actually just gonna loosen off the, the cartridge to make sure that there's no preload 
on the o-rings and they're squished i'm going to go ahead and just put the threads into the grease to ensure again that it doesn't doesn't in fact scratch the o-rings as it comes on through like so beautiful then we can go ahead and pull the shaft through that has worked really well now the next thing i'm going to do is put the eyelet on the bottom of the shock so i can see here we've got this beautiful smooth motion that is a super nice shock absorber and you can feel the tension i'm going to go ahead and do that up now i've got a few specialty tools here today now this is my shock shock pliers these are from aramax and they're all alloy construction um, hard anodized which a lot of it has managed to worn away these are years old and they help me build nearly every set of shock absorbers and work on the cars and they have soft jaws in them if you will to ensure that i can grab onto the shock shaft um, and apply pressure to stop it rotating but without scratching it whatsoever instead of putting like a rag or your, your side cutters or whatever on the shaft this these pliers ensure that you're not going to cause any damage or marks or nicks onto the shock shaft where it's got a seal and run through the o-ring give those a little tidy up okay now the shock eyelet there's a few of them here which one the v v5 so that is the short one let me put the short one on here like so i might as well get my shot cap off while i'm here the rest of it can go after put this one to the side i'll get these parts off for this damper unit as well got the cap here we go got the eyelet we'll put that off to the side so we'll go ahead and put our eyelet on get it started by hand it's important to keep it nice and straight grab on the shock shaft nice and firmly with the confidence that these pliers are not going to cause any damage to the shock shaft whatsoever go ahead and wind that on now in some manuals they will in fact give you a specific length and for me that the length's not quite as important i suppose at this part of the build but making sure that they are in fact even is more important so i've got a measuring tool that i'll use for that verniers and that way I can ensure that both of them are in fact the same length and a level playing field. So I've got my vernier calipers here as a reference. And this will measure down to the hundredth of millimetre. Zero that off. We'll get that out now. twenty one point eight five so I know when I come to assemble the second one which we'll do right now that I've got to get it to that length or adjust them suitably put this cartridge in like so and the machining and the anodizing on these shocks is absolutely amazing get the excess grease out of here Like so, get a little on the shaft again, over the threads, a little bit of rubber grease. Go ahead and pop that through. This cartridge. There we go. You can see we've got excess grease here. Just wipe that off. Like so. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Oh, same silky smooth feel. Go ahead and wind this eyelid on. OK, 
get it started. Like so, wind it forward. Twenty-one eight five was the magic number for the other one. Let's see how this one's looking. Twenty-one eight four. So one hundredth of a millimeter is close enough for me on a frog. Okay. And again, if those measurements were different, we just unwind it half a turn or a quarter turn, wind it up half a turn, quarter of a turn, whatever it needs until you get them the same, the same length. At least we know that they're both the same. Next thing that we've got to do is fill the shock absorbers. Now for this one, um, I've got another tool here, which is in fact a car stand that I use for racing. Now what that's going to utilize today, it's going to hold my shocks going to save them from falling over because when we bleed them we want them to be upright so I can go ahead and stand them up like so and put one over here and I can go ahead and fill it now Tamiya has included some damper oil in their kit um, but given the fact that this isn't going to be a shelf queen I'm going to actually play with this one and, and race this one actually later in the year I'm going to put a silicon weight a silicon shock oil again from XTR and that's got a specific viscosity rating on it of 30 weight, this one. And that, at least I know what's in there. So I can change the handling characteristics if I need to by either lowering the viscosity of the oil, the thickness, or raising it. So 30 is a good middle of the road and a good place to start. And we'll see what happens as we fill it up. So the instruction manual says to fill up the shock. Like so. And then you have to get all the air out of the oil to make sure that we've got silky smooth operation because we don't want air in the shock absorber we'll give it inconsistent feeling and they'll operate um, differently from each other so left and right will operate differently and so forth so the main thing here is consistency and correct operation they are designed to be full of oil not air So I'll go ahead and just, you can actually see it coming up to the surface here. It comes up like champagne bubbles into the oil. Very hard to catch on camera. So I'm just move, pumping it up a couple of times and we'll let that sit. And I'll do the same thing with the other. like so now the best thing is with these there's lots of ways to do shock absorbers the best thing is is to fill them up bleed them of the air and then potentially leave them for for half hour or so just to make sure that all the air is out of them because the air will naturally float to the top and come out of the oil we don't want that trapped in there if we can help it three or four times slowly spinning around moving it through the stroke there we go give those another few drops of oil like I said tend to make a bit of a mess when when making when building shock absorbers then we can go ahead and get our diaphragms ready our tops And our caps. I'm going to go ahead and put the smallest amount of grease on these tops here just to ensure that it doesn't bind when I do it up that it does in fact seat on the on the alloy and will act potentially as a little gasket. I'm going to put a little bit more on the inside of the cap here and that's just going to help seal the threads. Got that cap. I'll do the same thing on this one. The smallest amount of rubber grease on the top of the cap here. 
put it into the top of the shock, spin it, and I'll put a little bit more on the threads, like so. Okay, now we can go ahead and assemble the shock. You can see here, all the oil has worked its way to the top and come out. I'm going to keep it at the bottom of the stroke. I'm going to put in the diaphragm, slide that in from the side, let that fall under. Now there's a few ways to do shock absorbers, but what I potentially like to do, if I can, is just feel it with my, with my finger as I compress the shock absorber down. So I'll use here, I'll use my tray, it should be pretty, pretty firm, and that's getting out the excess oil without introducing any air. Put that all the way down until the, the piston the piston of the shock hits the diaphragm and then I'm going to go ahead and put the cap on like so. You can see it's quite an oily event this but it's better to have too much shock oil and bleed it out than potentially get air in there. Go ahead and tighten that up. Again at full compression and it all went together really nice. I can go ahead now and give it a good wipe over and get off any excess oil and check for smooth movement. So what I'm looking for is that when I meet maximum compression that it sits there and that it doesn't, doesn't squeeze itself back out. If it's over full with oil it will slowly come back down by itself about yay far. So what we're going to do is eliminate that. It's coming out a tiny bit, so I'm actually going to bleed it a little bit more. So I'm going to press it down. I'm going to loosen the shock cap. If I can. I'm going to press it down. Loosen the shock cap until I feel the oil come out. Press it down. There we go, like so. A little bit more oil came out. Bleed, and together it goes. And this time, we'll find that there's no air in there, but also, hopefully, it's not pushing itself back out. And that's what we call a dead shock absorber, which is what we want. We don't want any rebound, and we don't want any air. Like so, and there's no air in there. You can sort of feel air when it goes in there, it sort of uh, like squeaks a bit I suppose internally. Squeaks and squeals a little bit. So there we go, a beautifully built shock absorber. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to do exactly the same. Get some of that oil out. Go ahead and slide in the diaphragm like so and again down with the stroke excess oil coming out just until it touches the diaphragm we'll go ahead and put the cap on now don't be worried if you don't get it first time it just takes practice and patience Threads should go together nice and easily. And each shock absorber can behave a little bit differently. So just because it's done, it's taken two times on one shock absorber, it could be right straight off the bat with this one, or this time it might need to be bled three times. Let's have a look and see what we're, we're working with. Give it a good wipe over, all the excess oil out the way. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, so we've got nice, and you can see there it's pushing out again so we've got actually a little bit of rebound in there again so I'm going to go ahead loosen this one off my hands are all oily now 
like so. I'm going to go ahead and loosen the cap while compressing the, the shock body so we can feel a little bit of air come out. Go ahead and do it up. And there we go. All right. No rebound. Exactly what we're after. No rebound and no air. That is going to be a good little unit. Okay. And that is building, assembling, filling your shock absorbers and bleeding them. Next step will be getting them into the car. I'll go ahead and I'll pack some of this stuff away to not clutter my area. We'll get the instructions back out again. I can put this little car stand off to the side. Okay, what are we working with here? We've got our shock absorber, we've got our spring, and go ahead and put that in. And we've got our spring retainer. So, we need to get our spring. Aha, spring retainer. Like so. Again flashing off there. Go ahead and I'll put my spring retainer on. That to me isn't sitting right. Where is being just trying to find the right Parts here. Just bear with us a second, guys. Ah, here it is. It would help if I looked at the parts tree themselves. Spring retainer. Much smaller on the frog than some of the other models because the spring doesn't actually go over the shock body. A little bit unique to this car in the way it sits. Go ahead now, put that on, like so, spring retainer on, and we can see here that the spring is on and retained, got a beautiful shock absorber, no noise, beautiful smooth, that's what we're looking for, and presents really fantastic. Now I believe these are quite a step up from the original 1983 Frog. Not that I can say I've actually seen one in person, but I'm sure that they've increased the body. Those Teflon pistons inside those bodies just work amazing. Now we can go ahead and screw them to the car. And what screws do we need for that? We need some pivot pin screws. On my trays. Got this one, got four of these. One, two, three, four. Lovely. Got my nine steps screwdriver. Go ahead and screw those shocks onto the car. These are quite iconic of the frog, these damp units and their horizontal mounting. And even with oil on my hands, these screwdrivers offer amazing grip and stability. Go ahead now, put this on the arm.
like so. I'll get this one screwed up and then we'll run the suspension through its travel and see how it actually works. This one here. going together faultlessly. Typical Tamiya. Just amazing. Get this one in. Here we go. There we have our rear shocks mounted and in situ. And now you can see how the suspension works. Through the cantilever at the top here. Does compress it down. Quite a neat, reliable and robust system. And I'm really glad I took the O-ring out of that dog bone because it would have really affected the way in which that unit was working. Super cool. Very happy with that. All right, let's put that car to the side and let's have a look at the next part. Oh, the motor. The motor is one of my favorite things to work on, obviously. That's what makes it go. Now, I like to do something a little bit additional than just screwing the, the motor in. I like to actually bed the motor in or run the motor in. Now, this here is a 540 sealed can. And what I like to do to ensure that it's going to be running um, well straight off the bat is I'm going to submerge it in water while running it on a battery. And that's going to add resistance to the motor because you can imagine it's got to turn through the through the water it keeps it cool obviously because it's cold water and it will flush any debris and stuff out of the out of the can itself so here i've got a lovely plastic jar that i've i've reused we've got some water in there now i haven't done this on camera before so water could very likely go everywhere going to go ahead and poke these ones through if I can excuse me while I just got to make the whole thing I've got my hobby knife here like I said I've not done this Tamiya motor before on camera all right Got my gasket back in there. Poke one wire through, poke the other wire through. And for the purpose of the show, I won't leave it in there very long, but usually I would probably run this somewhere for a good couple of minutes. And I've got an old uh, single cell 3.7 volts here. So you don't need a particularly a particular high voltage. We don't want to spin it, spin it at maximum RPM. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in and and run the motor. Sorry about the noise. So we can see here, in fact, that the I can't tip it over, I'm afraid. But you can see here how all the debris is coming out of the motor and the colour of the water is changing. And that's just running in there, getting all the debris out of it. Just gonna run that for a couple minutes more. Okay. So we can see here, in fact, the color of the water has got a real murky color. If I hold it up to the overhead camera, so that did start as clear, clear, clean water. You can see all the rubbish has come out of that. So I'm just going to go ahead and take the motor out now and try it and dry it off. Sorry about the noise. Okay. I'll put that water to the side. 
Oh, we can actually, we can have another look at it actually. Now I've got the, the lid back off. And can you see the, the color of it? And that's all the, the rubbish and carbon and stuff come from the motor, from the initial build. So what that does is runs in the, the bushes a little bit, runs in the brushes onto the commutator of the motor where it's gonna run um, and should, in, should ensure, not only will it hopefully be faster, but it will last that bit longer as well now that it's all been running and nice and smooth. So I'm just gonna run it now, get all the water out. And in fact, I'm gonna oil it up. So a few drops of, of motor bearing oil here. Like so. I'll put some on the back. And that should be it. That will be good to go. Like I said, it's not something that's critical and not something that you have to do. It's something that I like to do to ensure that the motor is going to be as fast as it can and as good as it can. Give it a bit of a wipe over. Put a few more drops of oil in it. We'll work that in. Like so. Let's wipe off the excess. A few more drops in the, in the front bush. We'll give it a little spin. And we'll work it in. Again, we'll get rid of the, the excess. And now we have our running motor ready to install. So here we have time to put the pinion on. Okay, so where in fact did I put the pinion gear? I've got the gasket here for the motor. Now this paper gasket doesn't look much, but it's very important. So what that saves is dust coming into your motor and blowing into your gearbox. Because that's the last thing you want to do is get dirt into the gearbox because that will, in fact, wear it out a lot faster. So you just want to spin that gasket around until it all lines up. There we go. Motor screws. Oh, the pinions actually. Just bear with me while I find the pinion. Sorry, man. Uh, I'd put it down there. Okay, guys, I'm back with my pinion bag. Now, as we described in the gearing charts, so it actually does come with three options of pinion on this one, and I'm going for the largest one. So that should be as easy as just sizing it up. Now the largest one is gonna give me a higher top speed, is gonna flatten my battery the fastest, um, but given the fact that I'll be using it on the racetrack as well, it should, should really help me get, extract the most amount of speed down the straight. And because I'm not stop starting and on, on grass and, and stuff like that, I shouldn't put too much load on the motor anyway. So here I go, I've got the grub screw. Put that into the motor. And you can see here I'm using the nine steps tool for that, one and a half mil. And it's really important that you get that lined up onto the flat of the motor and get it in the position that they describe. And they're saying that it needs to be 16.5 mil overall length. So I'm gonna go ahead and measure that. I do in fact have my, my verniers here. Can go ahead and measure that length. 16.5 needs to come out a bit more. 
notice that it's 13.2 mil, not at 3 mil. Sixteen point five. Gonna set it here to give me an indication. Come out another two mil, like so. Can even come out a bit more. And that should be perfect, 16.47 millimeters. Okay, I can go ahead, put my verniers to the side again, and we can get the motor installed. Okay, so the parts I need for this are 330 mil. 230mm screws, sorry, for these long ones here. I need a couple of BA2 12mm tapping screws. It's going to be these big ones here. One, two, Then I'm going to need another two of these. One, two, and this one here. Two of these little tapping screws, like so. I need the pinion cover off the parts tree. This one here. Go ahead and cut that bit off. I've got a beautiful embossed Tamiya logo there. Now we can go ahead and get the motor into the car. So it comes in coming from the side here. We've got when one vent pointing backwards like that. We can go ahead and put the mesh on. You can see that it's all perfectly aligned. It's not coming out too much and it's not in too much. What I'm actually going to do though, is I'm actually going to put some grease on the gears. And I've got my favourite little gear grease here. And this is going to ensure that these gears, these plastic gears in this gearbox last as long as they possibly can. So I'm just going to go here and I'm not packing the gearbox per se, but I am putting it on the tooth count here of all the spur. It's as simple as putting it in and turning it, turning it over like so. I don't need to go crazy. And that should help both the spur, the idler, and the pinion gear, which is just alloy, last as long as possible. Run as smooth as possible, and hopefully be as fast as possible. Okay, go ahead and put that pinion back in. We'll locate this motor. Like so. cover on and I can get these screws done up like so again with the motor it's important not to do everything up tight until it's all well seated Make sure that the threads have started, everything's sitting nice. Just 
spin it over by hand. We've got a beautiful quiet gear mesh. Go ahead and tighten it up a little bit. Another half turn. Check it all out again. Go a bit more. And that should see beautiful that should see the motor installed to the frog so I'll hold it up to the camera here we can see here it's nice beautifully smooth we can see that diff action across the bevels and we've got a beautiful quiet gear mesh probably going to be a little bit tight initially but that's fine the whole car has to run in anyway we've run the motor in we've re-oiled it off we go so the next step is to put in the battery hold down well the end plates for the battery the battery recess I'll go ahead and cut those off and that'll be the last steps before we put the radio in so I don't think we'll put the radio in this episode but we will in fact put these covers on so go ahead and get the flashings off Right. And we can go ahead and put our end plates on. And this is also the mount for the antenna. So the antenna is going to mount on here. Rather large screws in this one. Four mil screws. These are the biggest screws in the car so far. Go ahead and put this one here. Quite a tight thread being 4mm. Again, we don't have to do it insanely tight. It's going its way in there. It's definitely not going to rattle loose. Can go ahead and put the other side on. And that will conclude today's build on the frog. Let me get these two screws in. I'll bring it up to the camera. And we can see in fact how much really looks like a radio control car. Okay guys, so that's the end of our third episode of the Frog Build. And you can see here now we've got working uh, the, the chassis together. We've got working front suspension. We've got a working rear suspension. We've got the motor installed the gearbox and the diff assembly which all seems to be nice and smooth so really looking forward really starting to take shape as a good little buggy and really looking forward to getting the radio gear in getting it painted up and getting it out on track i'm brett and thanks for watching <laughs>